If you have clicked on this video with the hopes of discovering more about heraldry, specifically regarding cadences, well, congratulations to me, uh, because my title has done its job and described the topic at hand accurately. Before we go any further, let me put my cards down on the table. One, this video is going to have an angle to it. I'm not going to simply try to provide you with the facts and let you come to your own conclusion, because that would be immensely boring for me and probably not a little tedious for you. If you just want facts, read Fox Davies' um, A Complete Guide to Heraldry. Yes, you can find it online very easily. And he should, pro he should provide you with the facts. Ultimately, I could have simply read out aloud the chapter on cadency in his book, but where would have been the fun in that? Two, to me, coats of arms are things that really serve a definite purpose, the same that it held originally, that of being an identifier. Granted, I do not mean this in the on the battlefield sense, since this art form, uh, this usage, would have died out centuries ago. But I really do mean in the sense of identify. Three, I will only touch upon the English-Welsh cadency, and not on the miasma, which is the Scotch way of cadencing, or the Irish, the Canadian, or the royal cadency system, both because I know too little about these, and because I cannot say I have a great interest as of yet in the, these other cases. Now I say English-Welsh because England and Wales fall under the prerogative of the College of Arms. If cadency in Wales is different, which I have found nothing to indicate that it would be so, then to quote the very quotable and quoting David Crowther, semi-remonstrances on his postcard. Four, this is my first ever video of my life, so I obviously want it to have a certain standard, yet I do recognise that inex inexperience will dog my journey. So please do not be too severe. I even had to figure out certain pronunciations. I mean, how often do you say the word cadency out loud, after all? Probably more than me, if you're that kind of buff. Um, now, think of the word purper, if even that's the correct way of saying it. That sounds anyway mightily uh, peculiar out loud. Um, probably pronouncing it the wrong way. After all, I thought that sable was pronounced sable or sable, or frog style, I suppose, but turns out sable. There we go. Now that you have had a good look at my hand, I will pick up my cards up again and onwards with the show. The goal I set myself is simple enough. At the end of this video, you should have been blessed with the knowledge of one, what cadency is and how it is portrayed, two, when cadency should be used, this part will be my deductions based on what I have seen and inferred during my time travelling through books of history and articles of heraldry. Because genius is the gift of being sublimely unoriginal, and also because starting with the basic usually is the most sensible way of commencing one's didactic attempt, let me first go over what you will get after a quick research on the internet, re-cadency, which usually takes one to Wikipedia. We'll find these little symbols, for want of a better word. I rather prefer this illustration, as it is the one I grew up with, my father having been given it when a boy. We subsequently perused the illustrations at length, and this is this has defined my perception, for the better, I like to think. Leaving the label, that's a straight line thingy with the three short straight lines protruding perpendicularly from it, let's touch on those of the younger sons first. We start with the crescent and finish with the double quatre, or the octave. What makes these different when in use is that they are permanently added. That being said, if a senior line dies out, i.e. that the male line dies out and there was, there was no desire for it to continue through a female line, then you can, in theory, go up a level. That having been said, if you have been using, say, the martlet for a good few generations, you might not want to do this. As a third son, I see no privilege of being an older son per se. Granted, they get the whole caboodle, but one. Remember, as I stated earlier, arms are about identity. Changing your martlet for a mullet, in theory, could be confusing to the outsider, as they would have associated the mullet with a different person of your family, who presumably just died. Also, who changes a martlet for a mullet? I mean, the martlet is the worst of all ca cadences. In name, <laughs> and in look, I would know. Two. Also, it is my belief that it is really only correct to alter one's cadency from whatever it was before to without a cadency. I.e., when all the senior lines, all the lines senior to one's own, have died out. 
There is something very tacky about trying to big oneself up. One is either the head of the house or a cadet branch. doesn't matter if you are crescent level or octopode level. Upgrading cadency is rather like crawling over the dead branches of your cousins in a bid to reach the top of the tree. Hmm, not nice. And should not, indeed, shall not be perceived as so. So that is what cadences are all about in terms of the modern usage, what you typically can see. So what we've just learnt is that one oughtn't to mistake a martlet on a coat of arms as automatically being a charge. It can refer to one being a cadet branch, as we can see with Walter de Beecham, Stuart to Edward I. But that does not mean it to be a cadency as meant up until now. This is a different way of stating you are a younger son, and we shall get to that later on. Also, martlets, crescents, mullets, and the such are used as ordinaries. So how do we make sure that we do not misunderstand the symbol of a cadency versus an integral part of the shield's design? Well, of course, there are rules for these. Either you need to put it in the centre chief point, which is heraldry speak for the centre middle. Quick side note, although I do understand these terms when they suddenly appear in texts, having to dig them up actively is not something that comes to me naturally at all, so do be kind. I do am learning as I go. So, where were we? Yes, so, the cadences of the second down to the last sum are usually either born in the centre chief point or fess point, dead in the centre. This is not always true, which is you didn't expect a said science, and guess again. Ultimately, the position will invariably depend on your shield's design, naturally. So if you are a Neville, centre chief point is definitely where the cool Neville kids are at. But the Corbett gang will typically favour the fest point, whilst the Scroop crew are going to go on a completely wild tangent and put it in the first quarter. So you see, you have to always keep in mind, one, your shield's design. Another instance is if you have a chevron, then you can display it not so much at the fest point, but in the middle of the chevron. You want your arms to look clean and clear, not messy. Which brings us to point number two. Ensure that you are clearly declaring the cadency mark as just that, the arms of the head of the house with a mark of difference. Again, identity. What you are not to do is to try and tuck it in a corner, out of sight and out of mind, so as to pass yourself off as a head of house. Jolly band form and all that sort of rot. Stuff that gets you blackballed, silly ass. Um, no, as I have stated, um, and will continue to do so, there is nothing wrong about being a cadet branch. And indeed, this makes you unique in your own way. As someone stated in one of the books I read up, I believe it was Charles Boutel, in Herald there are no marks of dishonour, even if it be a mark of illegitimacy. Also, to illustrate some more about why making your cad uh, cad cadency, uh, your identification clear, is a damned important, there once was a cadet branch who thought the cadency mark was not such a big deal and went into battle with the mark not made very clear. The problem was that their senior line was battling was batting for the other side and this at this very same battle. What happened was inevitable. The cadets' troops not adequately displaying a difference resulted in their own allies mowing them, uh, well, mowing him and his troops down in the heat of the battle and confusion of that battle, Talk about irresponsible, let alone damn right embarrassing. Now, you would have been blackballed one way or another. Alas, I cannot find where I read this up, or if it was on one of those most excellent Facebook pages that I subscribe to, but I do recall that it was portrayed as a true story. However, it could have just as well been apocryphal. If you do know um, that answer, do let me know. Modern cadet cadency now explained, we need to touch upon the label, probably the most well-known mark of difference of them all, but also not really a mark of cadency so much as a mark of the heir apparent. Now, I don't believe that heirs apparent use this when they are from a cadet line, i.e., let's say, the main son doesn't have any sons and the younger son's first son would not use um, a label. This would only apply to sons of the current head of the house specifically to the oldest currently alive one. As stated in the role of Calabric when referring to Sir Maurice de Berkeley's label, un label de azur à voix parce que ses pères vivent moi. 
what makes this that much more special as a mark of difference is if the first son dies in the lifetime of his father or for his pedant decesit vita patris when this happens then the first son of the first son inherits the label as the next heir apparent but whilst his grandfather and his father are still alive he should use a label of five points so as you can see this is both not your usual run-of-the-mill mark of cadency, as it is not kept in perpetuity by his sons, and is quite unique in its usage. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the latest devised way of cadencing, otherwise known as modern cadency. On the face of it, when it was put together by John Wright of Garter, the idea was simple, neat, and nearly what one could describe as an all-round elegant solution. But woe is heraldry, it turned out to be slightly messy, the concept being as follows. <laughs> Give that a few generations, and you can imagine the mess that creates. A few persevering chaps have actually stuck to their guns, and given us these beautiful examples. As you can see, this cannot be the solution in itself. Before I continue to what I believe the solution to be, the when part of this video's goal, the second part, I would need to touch upon the other ways of cadencing, because yes, there are many other ways. This way is hardly the be-all and end-all of cadency. It is one of around 15, depending on how you count them, but yeah, 15. I hope you enjoy the subject, because it's a long and bumper rad. Before I do proceed to describe the 15 other ways of marking yourself out as an unfortunate loser on the sun pecking order, I think it might be time, lest I be described as a bigot, or worse still, described as not being Anglo-Norman, perish the thought, time to describe where girls fit in. Where is the connection between women and Anglo-Norman, I hear you say? I'm pleased you asked. Listen on, and an answer shall be provided. The rule of thumb is that girls are all equal in the eyes of the heraldry law, which is, a, which is good in one way and bad in another. We see it being bad when baronies get put into bayance. If both female lines are equal, one of them needs to die out in order for the barony to be inherited. May the best baby maker win. Yikes. Grim. But no, so girls don't get a differentiating mark. They just bear the arms of their father, cadency mark included if applicable. That being said, they do have their own marks in Canada and in Ireland. So if you look at it historically, not having a cadency mark makes sense for women, as they would be joining their husband's house and not perpetuating their father's. Furthermore, coming back to identity, remember that arms were originally divided so one could identify each other on the battlefield, a place where one hardly expected to bump into a woman. Of course, with time, arms were not were more than battlefield identifiers and started to evolve a little from that. Here's a rather unique instance of Jane Fenton, daughter and heir apparent of Walter Fenton of Bakey, who bore a label in 1448 and subsequently dropped it after her father's death, as if she was a son. I mean, scandalous. I mean, the world has gone mad. Actually, this rather unique instance is, to my mind, only something unique in the sense that it was recorded and that the record was not lost, um, that she did bear a label, but not at all unique in spirit, and probably far more daughters did indeed use a label. Arms and titles passing through, if not the eldest daughter, one specific daughter, sometimes the one that did not marry a titled man, is not at all uncommon. For example, Lady Anne Beecham, who then married the heir of the Earl of Salisbury. Talk about greedy. We also see the Talbots using the arms of the House of Deanfer, rather than their rather elegant Norman arms. Um, or Sir Robert de Quincey, son of the first Earl of Winchester, uh, using his mother's arms of uh, Beaumont, rather than the Quincy's ones, probably in a bid at being the heir to the Beaumont pile. Alas, the de Montforts would get this. Although Quincy had a good chance, given that Simon de Montfort Sr. remained mainly in France all his life. So no, girls don't get a differentiating mark, but nevertheless hold their own and have their part to play in passing on arms, and in a way are more powerful than younger sons. Since younger daughters could sometimes inherit the father's pile, depending on whom they married. So before I continue, maybe I should now explain the quib with regards to the stated undesired epithet of not being Anglo-Norman. The thing is that given such 
importance to women was, n was natural to Anglo-Norman families. These were no namby-pamby stewards, worse still, namby-pamby Hanoverians. We speak of families that had been present at the Battle of Hastings, Bannockburn, Crissy, Harfleur, Agincourt, during the good times and the bad. And it is exactly because of, the, because of the bad times that in the eyes of the Anglo-Normans, passing land, arms and title through the female line was a given. One can simply imagine a conversation happening soon after the Norman conquest going along the following lines. Hello, mon prince, so um, can my daughter pass on the line, title and lands? Dieu, no, are you mad, my fine lord of wherever? Women as a vost, except my mother, of course. Okay, mon prince, well then you can forget me sending my only son to war. Adieu, no, uh, you did not say no, take the boxes. So I will say that girls can inherit. And this, if you care to devote five seconds of your time, makes a hell of a lot of sense. Understandably, men who fought and therefore held the burden of risk for having their tiny little brains used as floor decoration, well, it sort of follows that they would also be given the cool title uh, to the sons, the risk, and the spoils. But no father or son wants to leave their daughter or sister destitute and their line to die out or worse, pass on to that horrid little cousin of yours that laughed at you for peeing in your bed that one time. On a side note, from this we see the birth of the traditional household boss. The wife, as hubby was busy playing knights, the wife would be in charge of making sure that the portcullis was well oiled for his return, uh, deal with the pesky servants, ensure that the, guards, uh, the guard watch was, uh, was up to snuff and so on. Neither have women ever been stupid, au contraire. They have always had a vitally important role to play at the heart of the menage. But I digress. My point is that this very role affected Helvery as a consequence of this. We shall see more later on. Right, now that we have this out of the way, let's tackle the other styles of differencing. Let's make it simple, let me display all of them one by one. Right now, we are already familiar with the cadency markings of right. The other means are as follows, change of tincture. I'm going to try to stick to using old roles to illustrate this because sticking to the identifying theme I mentioned earlier, we're talking of people who needed to be distinguished for from other members of the same house whilst keeping the idea of the theme of the house arms alive. So these are change of tincture. This is probably the oldest way of handling cadet branches. Here we see arms of Zush of Ashby, the main line. And let's compare them to those of Zush of Lubbethorpe, the cadet branch. Simple, but very effective. By the way, I might be using their ancient arms, but well, I rather thought I would. That having been said, one has to be careful. One has to do one's research when one does this, um, because here we have Talbot, and one can imagine a younger son changing simply the tincture or colour of the lion. But this would be disastrous, as their arms would look exactly like those of the Greys of Heaton. This is probably why it's a very old way of doing it and no longer used because, well, so many people have coats of arms these days, you don't know what you're doing. Another option is usage of a border, um, border uh, or bend, uh, the former being something quite typically seen under the Plantagenet era. And to demonstrate this, we have Astley of Astley alongside Astley of Hillmorton. For the bend, we can use Grey of Codnor, what beautifully simple arms they are too alongside Grey of Rutherfield. The Greys are big on differencing, so if you enjoy seeing how one can difference arms, theirs is a house well worth delving into. I recommend Weapon Wiki for this. I, I purposely pronounce it with a W, as I feel the wikis should always start with a W sound. Uh, so, yes, I know it should be Wappen. Uh, the addition of small charges to the field. For this, we can compare Beecham of Elmley the original undifferenced arms against Beecham of Warwick. These are arm these arms are probably more familiar to you. I know they probably should not be referred to as of Warwick, but well, it's my video, so my rules. Um, and I will bend the rules. Uh, another interesting thing is that this way of differencing, um, once you know, one doing it by adding crosslets is actually a very old way of differencing one's arms and was at one point quite common i can't think why i read this but i definitely did read that somewhere the other option is to add charges to an ordinary like a chevron or as in this case 
a bend. Or I can also go for the addition of a label. This is used more often than you would think, and in more ways than one. One can simply use the usual label of three points, and this has been used by younger sons before any official labeling system was put in place. But before I get to an example of that, let me rather point out the case where it has been used by the eldest male branch in perpetuity. Here are two examples, Astley of Patzel, Hastings of Elsing. The latter case being quite famous as the Graves of Ruthin, who seem to like to collect arms and lands and titles like it's going out of fashion, uh, fought the Hastings of Sutton, I am assuming it was the Suttons, in the Court of Chivalry to have the right to use the Hastings arms undifferenced, something that the Hastings said was not fair since they were the only male descendants left and the heir to the name and house of Hastings. So here, we don't have so much a fight about lands and or titles, although I'm probably sure that this was somehow connected to that as well, but rather a fight for the right to an undifferenced arms. Anyway, the upshot was that the ruddy graves of Ruthin got to use the arms undifferenced, virtue of descending from the daughter of the first Baron of Hastings' first marriage, whilst the Hastings of Sutton descend from the first Baron of Hastings' second marriage. So girls won, boy zero. It is interesting to see how back then it was not only about keeping the house alive, as mentioned earlier, but the continuation of that union, the union between the first baron and his first wife. And I think this is something that was lost in the continental wave that was brought to us later on by the continental royal families. Now it's just the uh, now it's just the only male it's only the male descendants. How crass! How totally unfair! No, I shall go further. How totally un-Anglo-Norman. Before I close this grey Hastings case, we also see how Hastings themselves uh, courted their arms with Valence. This is because Valence used to be the Earls of Pembroke before Hastings was made Earl of Pembroke. And therefore, when Hastings were given this title, they most probably got it because they had the Valence lands. This means that they couldn't well have the lands of Valence without mentioning it in their name, especially if they had the title. And by name, we mean, of course, arms, which on the battlefield would display the Bari of Argent and Azur and Orle, an Orle of Martelet Ghouls. Of course, they needed to continue to use the Valence arms so that people would know that they were dealing with my Lord Pembroke, whatever his paternal line and lineage was. Look up what the first Earl of Pembroke's arms were before he was made Lord Pembroke, and note how he was the fourth son, and maybe it is this very case that gave Wright the idea of associating the martlet with the number four, or maybe it was already being used unofficially. Who knows? It's not me anyway. Funnily enough, the other case that I'm familiar with is the case of the Astleys of Patzel. The Astley land, title, and undifferenced arms passed into the, you guessed it, the graves of Ruthin. If there was a court case or not, I do not know. Probably the Astleys were too clever to go down the rabbit hole. Furthermore, the Greys actually had the right to the title and then had inherited the lands, so this here case was a far clearer cut one. But what we see as a result is that even though the Astleys quartered their arms with Harcourt, they kept the label to denote first son status, but not Hedda's house. They clearly do not want any misunderstanding here lest they get into trouble with the upcoming House of Ruthin. The Astleys would then remove this label eventually in the 16th century, when the Greys of Ruthin, now Dukes of Suffolk, were attained and attainment meant no lands, no titles, and no arms. In fact, no nothing. So that gave the right to the Astleys to now use their arms undifferenced. Hopefully, this helps you to better understand that it was natural to all that a daughter could indeed pass, if not their surname, something more telling, arms and lands, if not titles. Probably back then, what counted was not really your surname, but your lands, as in Sir Thomas Astley of Patzel, was probably put in one's mind's list as Sir Thomas of Patzel. Indeed, the Astleys would keep using Harcourt's arms as quartering for a long time after, in fact, until they sold Patzel. Yeah. Another thing that you might see is younger sons using not a label of three points, but one of four. Sticking to our theme of the Astleys, here we have the arms of Sir John de Astley, a second son, 
who was made a Knight of the Garter, and lived not an uneventful life, and of course he would have need to differentiate his arms from his elder brother's ones, and so remove the Astley label and put a label of four points en surtout, if that's the right expression. <sighs> Labels. The cadency that keeps on cadencing. Before we continue, I would like to use the Astley family one more time, if I may. The reason is because we are provided with a rather interesting diagram in Foster's Some Feudal Coats of Arms. This diagram is the one you see before you. Why I think it is worth a mench is that we don't see the illustration of a royal or a magnate family cadencing their arms, but rather a humble, if ancient, family doing it. This is gentry. Even though admittedly the older brother was a peer, this is gentry marrying other gentry. Yes, they would probably use terms like Lady Catherine in the way they did to denote a high-born lady, and my Lord of Wolvery, more in the style of Lord of the Manor stuff, but the families they married into were not peers, ergo, they were gentry. Now, what makes this diagram that much more interesting, if this is at all even possible, is that we have one instance where we see the resulting differencing mark made by the second son and the original differencing done by the third son, before his descendants opted for a more categorical difference. Now, what do I mean by this? Well, firstly, obviously, Sir William, Lord Astley, did not need to worry, neither did his daughter and her offspring, as they would be the main line. What I mean is that Sir William's younger brothers, firstly, would have used the undifferenced Astley arms, as currently they would not be at the head of any troop. They'd be part of the troop. Remember, arms were still very much a military thing back then. But given that the second son, Sir Thomas, would marry the Harcourt heiress, he would quarter his arms with Harcourt. Harcourt undifferenced, as her father was to be the head of the house. Now, he died before his own father, which made all this rather awkward. So Stanton Harcourt uh, was given to the younger Harcourt brother, the Harcourt uncle, whilst the Harcourt heiress, who married Astley, got Nelson and Patzel. All this inheritance business created a lot of bad blood between these two ancient families, but that's a tale for another day. The point here is that originally this branch of the Astleys did not use a label of three points, as I mentioned earlier. This was only used later on. First, as Sir Thomas's uh, seal bears witness, this branch was to use Astley undifferenced, quartered with Harcourt undifferenced. Which makes sense, given that he was clearly not Astley of Astley, but uh, Astley Harcourt mix. And he was also to be head of the House of Harcourt, and therefore his line would be more of a Harcourt than an Astley. Furthermore, his niece had not produced an heir by 1410, the date of the seal, so he might be the sixth Baron Astley once his niece died. She did have an heir, so that was that. Maybe this prompted him to add uh, the label, or maybe when he saw that she had married an heir um, and had an heir with a grey, he thought better of it. Who knows? But whatever it was, Sir Thomas's offspring would keep the Harcourt arms nice and free of any mark of cadency. Per the Surrey roll, it would seem that the young Harcourt, Thomas, inverted the Harcourt colours, i.e. red for yellow and yellow for red, or ghouls for or and or for ghouls, and this is also, by the way, a good example of a change of tincture. Now we come to the third son, Giles de Astley. Poor old Giles must have thought being a third son was no fun. I know, probably, I know. Uh, not only he would not likely be heir to anything, making him not a good prospect at all, and to cap it all, third sons get the mullet as a differencing. I mean, really, poor chap. Life was simply not going his way at this point, but actually it turns out that either a dutiful older brother, a William, or his wise father decided he would inherit the Wolvery lands. Maybe this is why they called him Giles, as Giles was the name of his grandfather and the ancestor who married the Wolvery heiress. Either way, here we see a butte in cadencing. What Giles used in his lifetime was rather ele a rather elegant throwback to his Wolvery ancestors' arms, namely Astley between three mullets or. Look how he compares to Sir Thomas Wolvery's ones. Nice reference, eh? Then his ancestors decided that it was more elegant, or maybe they wanted to pay more homage to the placement of the mullets, or maybe they just wanted to start their own line referencing 
um, that they were third son and therefore used three same fours. Who knows? But the result and the appreciation as to how it went from one to another is simply excellent as a means of giving you an idea of how it was done back when it really meant something. Sorry for that fairly exhaustive side note. Hopefully it was worth it. Heldry is interesting, but I do find the little anecdotes behind them really bring it all to life. So back to our list. The next type of cadency is adding a canton or adding a quarter. Let's use Zouche again. What you're seeing is that the fifth Lord Zouche of Haringworth used a canton, which is like a small quarter. Whereas the family seem to have used a quarter along with the ancient version of the arms. More balls, as you can see. Whether this is a mistake done by Wikiwappen or not is not too much of an issue. I put them one next to the other for you to appreciate the difference between a canton and a quarter. Another simple way of differencing is to add an ordinary, as we see here, as done by William Corbett. Another option is to go the other way and to diminish the number of charges, or ordinaries. Apparently, same word for the same thing. I could be wrong. I leave the purists to correct me. So sorry to make another quick pit stop here, but this is a really interesting case again that we have because you are not seeing a case where the younger son removed a charge, but the elder. Because the elder decided to go on a tour of Europe, well, he was not known as Thomas Corbett the Pilgrim for nothing. Anyway, when he came back from his travels, his father had died and the king had no choice to make the second son the heir. The Corbett's were Welsh marcher lords. They weren't some French aristo worried if his pantaloons were the latest fashion. These Corbett's had a job to do, and if he weren't there, the next son would have a go. Thus, Thomas was not made lord, of course, but got to keep Wattlesborough, another Corbett haunt, and he removed a raven, making it rather neatly into first son, one raven, second son, lord of curls, two ravens. Or one can change an ordinary, as we can see here, with the Cliffords of Appleby. Or even change some of, or all of the minor charges, and this is exactly what Beecham of Powick decided to do. Another option is to change the lines of partition, enclosing an ordinary. Now I scoured Waffen Wiki to find a case, but to no avail. And I am trying to keep the same visuals in a bid to be unnecessarily tasteful, but... Alas, as there was none available, I had to make one. So thank you to MS Paint. The other classic example is, as mentioned earlier, the addition of quarterings. Here is Astley of Patwell again. But a more interesting case is this one. It shows the arms of Sir William Pelham of Brocklesby, an English soldier and a one-time Lord Justice of Ireland. Note how his arms bear not a mark of cadency, but uses quarterings to denote who he is. But as you cannot quarter crests, he has had to mark out his crest as the one of a second son, which is slightly odd given that uh, Wright had come up with his cadency system pretty much the century before. Um, so Sir William was the third son of his father, but the first son of his father's second marriage. So it's all a bit odd. I suppose Wright's marks were probably just a reference even back then. Next, we come to augmentations. For this, I'm going to use the Pelham arms again. Granted, the Pelhams added this so that they could show off, well, I mean, celebrate their family's history and not to denote a younger branch, but you get the point. Usually, one sticks to a canton when trying to make reference to an achievement, but I suppose the Pelhams had a statement to make. We also see that the option of differencing by using official arms, Henry Dispenser, Bishop of Norwich, added a border, and we see many bishops doing this, well, referencing their position. Um, given that bishops, though, <laughs> back then weren't expected to have offspring, well, at least not legitimate offspring, um, this hardly is to the point. And in any case, usually such people impelled their arms, as we can see with the following example of a herald, denoting the arms of Sir William Dugdale. The odd thing is that it seems that the chief's colour has either been altered with time or that the um, the painting has altered its colour with time. Or maybe there was a mistake. Anyway, and we also have an example here of the arms of Richard Corbett, Bishop of Norwich. Again, something seems odd as the arms of Norwich usually have a field of azure. But again, it's more the point that I'm trying to 
to get across as best and actual correct arms, historically speaking. Anyway, again, impaling one's arms like this does cause them to be differenced, but only whilst you hold the position. But if you lose the position, then what does one do? And in any case, one's offspring cannot impale their arms with your officer's arms, because that wouldn't make any sense. If you're not the herald, then you would be impaling your arms with a herald's position. I suppose that they might change an, or add an ordinary to reference this, or add a, a canton. Ultimately, I'm not sure if this is entirely per the rules of the game, and the family arms might still need to be differenced as per the usual way. Then there is the option of an escutcheon en surtout. Again, this could be misconstrued as an escutcheon of pretense, which I'll show later on, and is not inheritable. If anything, this is the beginning to your sons using the quartering, but I suppose this would mean that as a younger son, you would have no need to use the mark of differencing. That being said, we could use the Schwarzenbergs as an example of an inheritable escutcheon. I believe that they're using them to denote that they hold this family's lands. I suppose they want to find a way of quartering without overdoing it. Again, not a perfect example. Um, the, as this is the Schwarzenberg's main line, but it helps to illustrate. Finally, Fox Davies also mentions the addition of an inner scutcheon. How this is different from the inner scutcheon, en surtout, I know not. But it might be the fact that you have many layers of inner scutcheons as one often sees in Germany, Austria, and Eastern Europe in general. It's not something I would describe as super elegant. Alas, I have no example of this, but I do remember seeing an inescutchion, well, an escutchionception on a statue in a park in Athens, close to the centre. So if you have been there and you do tend to look at arms, then you probably know of what I speak. Anyway, uh, answer on the postcard or comment, please. As you can see, there is no shortage of ways to differentiate your arms from that favourite and coveted first son. I have tried to use actual illustrations of younger sons using a differentiation where possible in the same families as much as possible so that you get a good feeling for how one family can and has played around with their arms. There is always the option to ask for a new grant of arms as a younger son. Obviously, back in the day, this was a given, back in the day when they were actually creating this, um, you were trying to show, a, you weren't really trying to show a link, but trying to tell everyone exactly who you are. Hence the Earls of Warwick and Leicester in the 13th century have completely unrelated arms. Nowadays, the point is more to tell a story and thus relate to the house itself, yet still state you are a different branch. If you like to research the past of a family and this family tends to be our midras, this is jolly helpful, as in Beecham that is of Warwick ancestry and the Beecham that is not, and is completely unrelated. It helps to tell you if you are on the right track. I come from a family of Johns, Francis's and Thomas's, as well as Richard's. Unfortunately, the cadet branch, which broke off way back in the 14th century, also is peppered with the same ruddy Christian names. You can now imagine how annoying and confusing this can be. But when arms are associated with the name, it makes one's life that much more easier. A little pointer, heads of houses do also change their arms. They add quarterings, augmentations, and the such. How this plays out for younger branches, who could in theory use the undifferenced version, would be interesting to see. I, for one, would be jolly intrigued to know how that pans out. I would assume that if you add a coat of arms by royal license as a quartering, I would suppose that the younger branch are free to use an undifferenced version of the arms. Again, this bears as a witness to the head of the house uh, of the house's arms, usually territories, evolving, lead, uh, you know, leaving the cadet line to be the line that would inherit the original territories if the senior line dies out and has gambled away the family dosh. Remember, it is not only titles but lands as well that link closely with arms. Not in the sense that the French would see it. The owner of Astley Warwick, for example, today, would not be entitled to the Astley arms and, and title. But you do see some families using arms that have no technical blood relation to them, um, though they are used to designate a land denomination. Talbot, for instance, uses the arms of Montgomery, who are the original lords of Shrewsbury. Okay, finally, you can now say that you understand what cadencing is and how to differentiate yourself from the head of the house. And thus, we come to the more subjective part of all this, 
when to use a marketplace and seize. Let's not forget that we're talking of arms, the thing warriors put on their shields to distinguish themselves from other members of their house, be they senior or cadet lines. Well, another thing that I ought to mention, which is by rule of thumb, and maybe this is me picking up what the grown-ups were saying at the dinner table when I was a bit a mere nipper, and I wasn't probably understanding them, but apparently I had heard that the done thing was to only use market cadencies after one's father is dead. Until then, using the analogy that I used earlier, you are going to serve in his troop, his regiment, so you're going to use his arms, your father's arms, except, of course, for the first son, who is going to demarcate himself as heir of the house. The rest are there to serve the family. Anyway, just keep in mind that nowadays, unlike back in the warring centuries, one oughtn't to simply quarter the arms of one's wife's father, but rather have these arms as an escutcheon pretense. As so. Of course, this is enough to demarcate yourself from the rest of the litter. Such a difference is applicable after the marriage, be it in the lifetime of your father or not, that is neither here nor there. And, as such, you could distinguish yourself by joining your wife's family's arms, but only if she is an heiress, and you will inherit those arms and, more importantly, the lands associated with it. You would be joining your father-in-law's troops, as it were, in preparation of being heir to that house in Iure Oxoris. The latter situation is often seen throughout history. I will use the kinmaker again as a reference in this, instant, in this instance. A quick side note, if she is no heiress, you can impale you know, her or her father's arms with yours, and this will help to state that you are the Smith that married Jones, and is certainly a solution as well. So it does mean that you can never separate them uh, for the whole lo lifetime, and never, it will never be its own shield. It, mm, yeah, I suppose, de gustibus et corribus non disputand est. Another point to bear in mind, when one quarters the arms of one's wife's family, one can, in time, if the situation presents itself, update or remove altogether the cadency from that coat of arms. Although permitted, for me this is a silly thing to do, as you do not descend from the last head of house, but of course, for example, you're the, let's say, the fifth son of the head of the house four generations ago, why rewrite your history or confuse it? Conceivably, if you have inherited the family packet, then yes, then I would say it makes sense to remove the cadence mark. But this only comes back to what I mentioned earlier. Identity. You know, linkage to land and all that. In view of this, one might take the view that using a mark cadency, i.e. crescent, mallet, martlet, etc., can sometimes be perceived as bottom-of-the-barrel stuff, as this means you did not marry an armidurous family and none of your foremothers was armidurous during the time your family possessed their arms. Although I would not say this is necessarily true. For instance, I have quartered arms, not in the sense of mark of cadency, uh, but in the sense that they were welded together through royal license. That means that I, if I were to quarter my arms with other arms, it would really render it very inelegant. So I do not see that as an option. A busy coat of arms is never a desirable one. So sometimes one goes for the different ways of cadencing in order to attain the best and most suitable look. You know, a very busy coat of arms in the middle of a battlefield is going to be unintelligible and unreadable for the opposition and for your allies. Um, so we saw what that happens, and uh, what happens when that's not clear. Um, back to the when of cadency. I, of course, realise that I'm not being so much a right stick in the mud than stick, branch and trunk. But I do believe it is well worth to visit the use for this, and also this deduction explains why the College of Arms sees no need for cadencies, as in times of a medieval war, if you have no backing of your own, you simply join the head of the house's troops, or some other troop altogether. So the case for cadency should only be used, to my mind, when you need to demarcate yourself. Say you have made a name for yourself, um, you know, have a company or uh, an artisan, you know, you're an artisan or a lawyer or the such, or, you know, you're knighted or you have uh, your own title. In the latter instance, uh, you are required by heraldry law to, uh, to have a cadency mark. One cannot, you cannot have two barons going around with the same coat of arms as they are by default heads of their own houses by virtue of being peers in their own right. Else, you really do fall under follower of the head of house. And it does not mean you have failed, this means that you serve a different function 
in the family. And in this light, you may keep the head of the house's arms for your own, i.e. arms undifferenced. This is actually nicer for you. Using cadency for cadency's sake should be perceived as self-aggrandizement, which is neither the point of heraldry nor the behaviour of a gentleman. Ultimately, it boils down to the need to distinguish yourself from someone else. It does not mean that you are not special, we all are, just that you are not distinguishable from the opposition's point of view. Harsh words, yes, but you are talking of a Norman warrior's tradition. This is no wimp territory. Needless to say, all this is taking the purpose of cadency to an extreme, and probably bringing to light the College of Arms' thoughts on this subject by what one can deduce. If you feel that you want to mark yourself out because you want to, then by all means do so. Also, from a genealogist's point of view, the Scotch way of doing things is jolly helpful, as tracking family lines is made that much easier, so long as each cadet branch tries to reference the previous generation's look. What you have to understand is that I have put across my own opinion, not backed up by anything at all legit, and I have done so quite forcefully in a bid to get this message across. Don't be eager to change or alter your coat of arms, only do it when it makes sense. When I see the amount of rather naff arms created these days, here we have Sir Edward Heath's KG MBE's arms. I mean, wow, RS North has done the best a very bad job. When I saw them originally by some other luckless artist, I thought they had looked far more than I saw. Now imagine adding cadency to that. If anything, you might want to use the option of changing the ordinaries and the tincture in order to correct it, ha ha. But then again, when you are born to a certain coat of arms, they might look like they came out of the rear end of a dyspeptic bulldog, but it is up to you to uphold them by hook or by crook. Let's take a more obvious coat of arms, those of the Dukes of Wellington. Again, it is not the nicest looking coat of arms, especially with the Union Jack in centre chief. We know why they have this Union Jack augmentation and what it refers to, it's a damn tacky thing to have spot bam and the chief uh, in chief of one's escutcheon, but the ugliness of one's shield serves also to pay witness to the beauty of one's family's achievements. So we should try to think more of the arms as holder of one's family history and of what that ancestor achieved in order to acquire them, because that is, I believe, the essence of modern heraldry, and the essence of the point I was trying to get across. Your ancestor achieved something in order to be Ard Midras and be elevated to the gentry. If you want to stand out from his achievement and start your house and thus add a cadency distinction, so do you too need to have achieved something to warrant you altering them for your benefit. Okay, so this latter part of my presentation is really for those who are trying to find out if or why they would need to put a cadency on their arms. If you are looking for how, do just disregard this part. The fun part of heraldry is that we can design parts of it, even after an ancestor has given the main design. And I do not want to discourage such fun in any way. I think the when of heraldry is important and interesting, but not to the point that you feel that the fun has been taken out of it. Some people are very serious about heraldry, but that does not mean that those who want to play with coats of arms are wrong. Thus, I have had to strongly consider switching off the comments, because as an amateur in the real sense of the word, as well as in the modern sense, I am sadly lacking in some aspects. Vernacular, knowledge of arms outside my own family, and all-round ignorance, and thus fear a complete and utter roasting in the comments, either of my obvious mistakes or my strong opinion. I have left them on, so do be gentle and be kind, be respectful. I can get things wrong, but then, if you think about it, when speaking of vernacular, we don't quite know how they thought about this stuff back in the golden age of heraldry, and doubtless your Nevilles and Talbots and Harcourts would not have known words and expressions like profess and nebulae, and just called a spade a spade, and, well, a lion, a leopard at least. Continuing on the topic of the second part, it's an opinion. Although I don't wholeheartedly agree with 100% of what I said, it's important, if one tenders forth an opinion, to go to the end of it and flesh it out completely. As for the what part, I cannot say that it is complete, but it should cover a good 70 to 80%. There are so many special cases, like there was one that I saw in Gwilym where the label appeared diagonally across the shield, and one could expound in certain cases oddities or unique occurrences, but this would be far too tedious for both the audience and the author. Before I finish, it of course behooves me to say a big thank you to Wappen Wiki for providing us with such tasteful versions of these mostly ancient coats of arms. 
You might have noticed I changed a few to suit the context, and I hope I did him justice. I need to also thank R.S. Norse. Although I did not use much of his renditions, I do like his style as well, as it really brings forth the colourfulness, the, the brightness side of the medieval taste. I should probably also thank the many Facebook pages I subscribe to, to, to who provide the odd nugget of heraldry or historical trivium. And of course, thank you for your attention. Your choice of rotten vegetables is to the left of the door as you came in, or simply press on the thumbs down button.